basicamente apresentar algumas, algumas, alguns delineamentos aí muito, muito introdutórios sobre a trajetória do, do professor Arne Kalberg. Uh, o Arne, como o Marcelo enfim, disse, ele é professor da Universidade da Carolina do Norte, em Chapéu Rio. Uh, ele foi, enfim, em diversas ocasiões, uh, chefe do departamento da Carolina do Norte. Uh, é especialista em Sociologia do Trabalho e foi, uh, é presidente da, da American Sociological Association, Associação de Sociologia Americana. O professor Ali tem, enfim, uma quantidade de, de livros bastante grande, como vocês podem supor. Eu destacaria alguns deles que me parecem bastante emblemáticos, da, da, vamos dizer assim, dos interesses de pesquisa que o Ali uh, tem sustentado nesses últimos, nessas últimas décadas e meia, pelo menos. Uh, um que eu destacaria, que é provavelmente o livro mais conhecido dele, nos Estados Unidos, naturalmente, é o Manufacturing and Ventures, que é um estudo uh, sobre o, uh, o, 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 as equipes de trabalho de alto desempenho, o subtítulo é um pouco esse, quer dizer, uh, o trabalho de alto desempenho compensa, né, é uma, foi uma pesquisa uh, comparativa em diferentes países, uh, Noruega, Estados Unidos, Japão uh, e outros, outros, outros países, enfim, uma pesquisa comparativa bastante ampla, Uh, um, outro, um outro livro bastante conhecido do Arne também é o Fight for Time, Tempo e Tempo, que é um, um, também um, um, uma pesquisa comparativa, uh, tentando, buscando relacionar o tempo de trabalho uh, com o tempo livre, em diferentes contextos, em especial uh, nos contextos uh, familiares. Uh, e mais recentemente, aliás, no ano passado, o, isso também, também demonstra um pouco, a, 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 vamos dizer assim, a, dar indicativos, né? de como o, o, o Arne lida com a, 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 como ele relaciona a sociologia do trabalho com ah, a, as intervenções, enfim, ah, políticas, né? O Arne, ele publicou junto com o John Edwards. O John Edwards foi ah, candidato na, na, na chapa do John Kerry, que perdeu a, a eleição americana para o pro, pro Bush que recentemente participou das, das primárias do Partido Democrata Americano, é um candidato também, é, é um, enfim, um senador da Carolina do Norte, professor em Chapel Hill, muito vinculado ao sindicato, ao movimento sindical americano, que perdeu uh, as primárias para pro, pro Barack Obama, né, enfim, uh, nos Estados Unidos. O John Edward, o, o, o Arnold John Edward, uh, escreveram e organizaram um livro com muita, uh, muita contribuição do uh, tanto de, de, de colegas sociólogos dentro dos Estados Unidos quanto fora, uh, chamado uh, End in Poverty in America. <risos> Obrigado, Marcos. Uh, End in Poverty in America, e que de, de alguma maneira uh, sumariza, sistematiza essa, esse conjunto de ideias que foram, enfim, sendo, sendo acumuladas aí pelo debate americano e internacional de formas, enfim, de combater a pobreza nos Estados Unidos mas não apenas. Isso aí já aponta para a atual pesquisa que o, que o Arne tem desenvolvido, que por respeito ao trabalho precário num contexto global. Então é um pouco sobre essa, essa vamos dizer assim, essa nova etapa da pesquisa que, que o Arne tem desenvolvido que ele vai falar uh, aqui para a gente. Uh, enfim, é isso. Uh, thank, thank you very much, Rui, for that very nice introduction. And um, I'd like to say that I'm very happy to be here at Kashambu, uh, at the ANPOX conference, uh, and uh, to visit Brazil for the first time. Um, after my talk, I believe there will be an opportunity to have a debate uh, and discuss, discuss questions. Uh, what I am doing now is trying to wait a few minutes until we get the video show up. And uh, because I think that will help uh, explain some of the things I am trying to say. Can everybody hear me okay? Ah, okay. Corrado, corrado, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, this looks good. The other session ended a little later than normal, so we are a little late getting started. But I understand this is Brazil, and so people are more relaxed. Okay. 
Let me, let me start by telling you what I will be talking about, and then we will get the um, photo show sorted out uh, in a few minutes. I will be talking about a topic that has become a major source of contemporary concern. Since the 1970s, precarious work has become a major problem for all countries of the world. By precarious work, I mean work that is uncertain, insecure, and in which the risks are borne by the worker. Precarious work is not new. It has been a problem ever since people started working for money. However, social, economic, and political forces that have been operating for several decades throughout the world have made work more precarious. Pierre Bourdieu saw precarité as the root of problematic social issues in the 21st century. Ah, I knew it would happen. Now, do we have a way to advance it? Okay. Ulrich Peck, the German theorist, describes the creation of a risk society and talks about the Brazilianization of the West, by which he meant the transfer of insecure, informal, temporary work from Brazil and other countries like Brazil to the West, to Europe and to the United States. Others have called the events of the past 30 years the second great transformation. If you push it one more. Precarious work has far-reaching consequences that cut across many areas of concern to social scientists. So what I'm going to be talking about today is not only a major issue for people who are interested in studying work, but for all kinds of social issues. Precarious work has created insecurity and has many, many consequences, not only for work, but also for many non-work things, like stress and education and social outcomes, as well as for political instability. Therefore, it's important we talk about these issues today. I will, here is the outline of my talk. I will first summarize some of the reasons why there has been a growth of precarious work all over the world for the last 30 years. I will then talk about some of the consequences of precarious work. Next, I will discuss some of the different kinds of precarious work in different countries. And finally, I will discuss some challenges for social policy of precarious work. First, why has there been an increase in precarious work? Precarious work in the last several decades has resulted from the growth of globalization, by which I mean economic interdependence, and 
against the spread of neoliberalism. The idea that markets are the answer and social protections and regulation is not necessary. These changes have been supported by technological change, which made possible globalization. As well, there has been a decline in unions and an increase in individualism. All of these factors have contribute, contributed to an increase in precarious work. I will first talk a little bit about the growth of precarious work in the United States, because that is the country I know best. I will then talk a little bit about the growth of precarious work in Brazil. In the United States, the most recent era of precarious work is generally agreed to have begun in the mid to late 1970s. The years 1974 to 75 mark the start of macroeconomic changes such as the oil shock that helped lead to an increase in global price competition. U.S. manufacturers were challenged initially by manufacturers from Japan and South Korea in the automobile and steel industries. The process that came to be known as globalization intensified economic integration, increased the amount of competition faced by companies, provided greater opportunities for companies to outsource production to low-wage countries, and opened up new sources of work of workers through immigration. Technological advances both forced companies to become more competitive globally and made it possible for them to do so. Changes in legal and other institutions mediated the impacts of globalization and technology on work and employment relations. Unions continued to decline, weakening a traditional source of institutional protections for workers and, and severing, breaking the post-war labor social contract. Government regulations that set minimum acceptable standards in the labor market eroded, as did rules that govern competition in product markets. So there was a general deregulation of markets. Union decline and deregulation reduced the countervailing forces that enabled workers to share in the productivity gains that were made and the balance of power shifted from workers to employers. The pervasive political ch changes associated with Ronald Reagan's election in 1980 accelerated business ascendancy and labor decline and unleashed the freedom of firms and capitalists Thank you. And enable and, and enable capitalists and, and firms to do basically do what they wanted. Political policies in the United States, such as the replacement of welfare by workfare programs, made it essential for people to participate in low wage jobs. Ideological changes toward greater individualism and personal responsibility for work and life supported these structural changes. The slogan, you're on your own, 
replace the notion of we're all in this together collectively. The neoliberal revolution spread throughout the world, emphasizing the centrality of markets and market-driven solutions, privatization of government resources, and removal of government protections. These macro-level changes that began in the mid-1970s led employers to seek greater flexibility in their relations with workers. The neoliberal idea at the societal level was mirrored by the greater role played by market forces within the workplace, eroding the bureaucratic organizational model of the standard employment relationship in which workers were assumed to work full-time for a particular employer at the employer's place of work, often progressing upwards on job ladders within internal labor markets. Management's attempts to achieve flexibility led to various types of corporate restructuring, which in turn led to a growth in precarious work and transformations in the nature of the employment relationship. This in turn had far-reaching consequences on all of society. That's the story for the United States. The story for Brazil, I believe, is very similar. In Brazil, the expansion of precarious work came a bit later, in the 1990s, with the increase in privatization and deregulation that accompanied the commitment to neoliberal ideology and the Washington Consensus. The neoliberal agenda appeared late in Brazil relative to other Latin American countries, perhaps because there was already a large and sophisticated industrial structure in Brazil, unlike elsewhere in Latin America. In Brazil, the increase in precarious work involved the adoption of the liberal reforms of privatization and the opening up of the economy, which provoked major dislocations in industry and the labor market. It also weakened labor unions. The majority of the companies modernized their production processes, increasing productivity, but reducing the number of employees needed. In the jobs that remained, there was demand for higher qualifications from the workers, and much of the newer employment that was created during this period was at the lower end of the labor market. There was also slow growth in gross national product, GNP, from 1990 to 2004, just 15% over this period, and this low growth combined with a strong increase in labor productivity in both agriculture and industry led to a major problem of unemployment, social exclusion, in turn, this greatly expanded the informal sector and led to a loss of job quality, creating more bad jobs in the formal sector. So the story for Brazil is very similar to the story for the United States, except it happened a little bit later. Now, precarious work is not new. One could argue that precarious work is normal. In the United States, most jobs were precarious and most wages were unstable until the end of the Great Depression in the 1930s. Pensions and health insurance were almost unheard of among the working class before the 1930s. 
and benefits such as those associated with what we call welfare capitalism dependent on workers being docile and passive rather than represented entitlement. The creation of a market-based economy in the 19th century increased precarity during this period. The Hungarian theorist Karl Pallady in The Great Transformation, written in 1944, describes the organizing principles of industrial society in the 19th and 20th centuries in terms of a double movement struggle. One side of that movement was guided by the principles of economic liberalism and laissez-faire that supported the establishment and maintenance of free and flexible markets. And it was the creation of these markets in the, 18th, in the 19th century that he referred to as the Great Transformation. The other side was dominated by moves toward social protections that were reactions to the psychological, social, and ecological disruptions that unregulated markets imposed on people's lives. Markets are good things, but they create problems. And when they are allowed to operate freely, you need to protect people from the market. The long historical struggle over employment security that emerged as a reaction to the negative consequences of precarity was won by the victories of the New Deal and other social protections in the 1930s. So this figure illustrates this pendulum-like movement between flexibility through markets and security through social protection. In the United States, here is my summary of, the, of how the pendulum operated. Back from the 1800s and up until about 1930, markets were dominant, employers had flexibility, there was a great deal of uncertainty and precarity. This led to a lot of concern, uh, it led to a depression, and a concern about the market. And so what happened was the New Deal came in, established social contracts, established certainty, established regulation, then, as, as my story, uh, I, as I told my story earlier, in the mid-1970s, you had the growth of precarious work again, as markets became deregulated, as unions declined, as people became uh, uh, more insecure, and as employers required greater flexibility. Now... There was a cry in the United States for more regulation. It's true in the labor market, and if you pick up your newspaper at any day of the week, you will see that there's also a lot of concern with regulating capital markets uh, as well as other kinds of markets. We, we realize now that markets less unregulated don't work very well. And so what I hope to see in the question marks there is a new uh, social contract in the next period of time. So that's the story about how we got there. Now let me talk a little bit about why you should care. Maybe you don't care about the sociology of work. Maybe, uh, maybe, 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 who knows. But you should care about this because what the, the story that I have told you is important for other reasons, too. One reason is because the growth of precarious work has led to more economic insecurity. The United States, like Brazil, has a very large problem of, in, of economic inequality. 
Part of that is due to insecure, precarious work for those at the bottom, as well as for the middle class. In addition to economic inequality, people are more insecure economically. There are also economic, economic incomes are more volatile. They change a lot. Just like the stock market can change a thousand points now in the U.S. Everything is more volatile due to precarity. You should also care about precarious work because it affects people. People who work in precarious situations are more stressed. They have more mental depression. They are physically less healthy. Um, it's not a good thing. It also affects families. Having a precarious work situation makes it difficult for parents to, to decide if they should get married, how many children they should have, where they should live, whether or not they should buy a house in a, in a certain area because they may not be able to live there in the future. It also affects communities. Precarious work leads to precarious communities. People who have precarious, insecure jobs may not be willing to invest in the community because they don't think they will be there for a long time. And so the social life of the community goes down. So for all these reasons, I would argue precarious work is an important issue and deserves your attention uh, regardless of whether or not you are interested in, in the sociology of work. Now let me turn to types of precarious work. As I said, precarious work is a worldwide phenomenon. All societies are facing similar challenges. The full employment society has come to an end. In fact, it probably came to an end a number of years ago. What is most problematic about precarious work, though, differs 